Okay, um, if, you, if you got my email yesterday, you know I put up a valuation of Shake Shack on, my, on, on the page for the class. It's actually an interesting company. I mean, take a look at it. I was, uh, the, the question I would have was whether you think its valuation is driven a little by having a home field advantage. And what I mean by that is the bankers were pricing Shake Shack, obviously tend to be in New York or London or, you know, and they think $15 for a burger is cheap. And it's, um, maybe that's feeding into what people think about as a potential market. Because the market's there. You know how big the market for burgers is? I, I found this out only yesterday. It was, it was shocking. I didn't realize how big it was. Just how much money Americans spend on burgers each year? $73 billion. It's a lot of burgers that people are eating. $73 billion. Uh, you work out the, the, the math on how many burgers the average American eats, but it's a big market. It's hugely splintered, right? It includes everything from your local neighborhood joints serving burgers all the way to Burger King, so it's hugely splintered. And this is a premium burger market. This is basically you're not charging $4 a burger, you're charging $15 a burger, and you call it Kobe or whatever you want to call it. No? So essentially, so it's a, it's a much smaller segment, and that's the question, is how much of that segment you're going to be getting. And there are players already, you know, you, you've got uh, Five Guys, you've got Smash Burgers, you've got all these premium, and they're all fighting for that space. I wouldn't invest in Shake and, sh you know, because it doesn't, Shake Shack, because it, I, I think it's a very, very tough game to win. But you can see how they're kind of approaching the game. The only thing is that's truly striking about that prospect as a reader when you get a chance is how in your face they are about not caring about investors. It's a really audacious, founder-driven document that says, this is our company. You can give us money if you want, but don't even waste your time telling us what to do. It's very clear. It comes through. And that strikes me the wrong way, but that's just me. So if you get a chance, read the prospectus, even if you decide not to do the valuation. If you do try the valuation, now check the numbers as you get to, now I think I gave them 1.2 billion in revenues by year 10, which is like Ruby Tuesday kind of revenues. I mean, if you think they're going to be Chipotle type revenues, that's 4 billion, they're worth about 65, $70. If you think they're you know, McDonald's kind of revenues, that's an entirely different ball game altogether. But that's a way to think about your narrative, is what do you think this company will look like if it succeeds? Don't even ask what will it look like if it fails, because you know exactly what it will look like. There'll be nothing there. But ask what, what do you think it will look like, and then create a valuation to back it up. 
The others, did you guys notice as you walked in that there's some announcement for a sports yes. conference? Yeah. I thought it was a joke initially when I saw the two names under the conference. What are the two? Do you see the two Tim names? Tim Coleman from Blackstone. That's okay. And what was the other name? Frank McCourt. Frank McCourt talking about how to manage a sports team is a little bit like Charlie Manson talking about how to live life in a good way. <laughs> this, is, this is a guy who massacred the Los Angeles Dodgers. I mean, if you get a chance, it is, I mean, he just decimated the team. It, he had a fight, I mean, he had a divorce thing with his wife. It was a whole nasty, but I, you know, I was telling the corporate finance class that maybe this is part of a sequence of sessions that Stern is offering on sports franchises. Next week, Brian Cashman will be talking about how to sign a third baseman cheap. <laughs> followed by James Dolan and how to destroy a professional basketball team in three easy steps. And we'll top it all off with Rex Ryan coming in the week after about how to nurture a young quarterback. Four weeks, we'll get the whole thing done. No? So it, it'll be interesting to watch. I'm fascinated with sports. I'm fi fascinated with finance. And tomorrow, a day after tomorrow, actually, I'm going to be at, um, in Boston talking to the MIT Sports Conference about the value of a franchise. In fact, the description actually I don't agree with, which actually gives me a great starting point. Because the, the description of the session is sports franchises are difficult to value. Is that true? Maybe. Actually, they're easy to value. If you can value Shake Shack, a sports franchise is a slam dunk because there are only three ways you can make money as a sports franchise. One, of course, is gate receipts, which used to be the only way you made money 50 years ago. The second is merchandising. And the third, and this is the big elephant in the room, is it's media. It's media and TV. Seventy percent of the revenues come from media and TV. And the way, in fact, different sports kind of separate the TV contracts and this determines what the. So, if you ask me to value franchise, and I actually have a valuation of the Clippers in that, in the pre I'll put the presentation up, and maybe because it's MIT, they'll probably record it and it'll be on YouTube sooner or later. So, I'm not. I wouldn't. If it does come up, I'll put the. No. But I have a valuation of the Clippers, and it's a pretty easy valuation to do because the gate receipts are kind of set by the arena you play in and the prices. The media contracts, at least for the moment, are you know what the uh, you know there's a 2016 renegotiation coming in the NBA, which is going to change. But you can forecast that. Say, so, but you're making estimates. If those estimates are going to be relatively easy to make. It's not like estimating how many burgers Shake Shack is going to sell. And so I, I valued it about, you know, even if you take the most optimistic spin, about 800 million. You know why I picked the Clippers, right? Last year, what happened to them? Palmer bought them for how much? Two billion. Two billion. Valuing a franchise is easy. Pricing a franchise is really difficult. <coughs> and here's why. Price is set by demand and supply, right? The supply of professional sports teams is limited. You add up all the professional sports, the NBA, the NFL, the NHL, soccer, you, I'm not talking about US Soccer League because that's kind of, but you know, Manchester United, Barcelona, IPL, which is the Indian, so you have about 180 professional sports teams out there. And here's the reason pricing is difficult. All you need is more than 180 crazy celebrities and that's what's happening to sports franchises is, and that's, and that's my rationale for why Barmer paid. He's not buying it as a business, he's buying it as a play toy. It's a very expensive play toy. It's a billion too, but new at 20 billion, you can afford to spend 1.2 billion on your Lego. This is his Lego that he's going to play with. He gets to invite his friends, sit in the front row. Look at how much fun Mark Cuban has with the Mavs, right? Why should he have all the fun? And here's the problem. You have 160 professional teams and more than 160 crazy celebrity-driven people. Who knows what the price will be? I mean, it's either a way in which you buy celebrity dumb and, and get to, or you buy respectability. In fact, look at the number of teams that Russian billionaires own. And if you're a Russian billionaire, you're already dancing on the edge of, are you actually doing anything to generate the billions. So the way you buy respectability is you buy the Manchester United team or you buy you know, uh, Barcelona. So it's actually a fascinating process because it has nothing to do with cash flows and growth rates. To price a professional sports team, you've got to price 
that celebrity is most interested in that team. That's not going to be easy to do, but that's I think, and it goes. And the reason I bring this up, it goes very much to the question of pricing versus valuation. And the reason people go dance between the two is they get confused. Say, Value must be difficult. Look, how do you explain the two billion? I don't have to. I didn't pay it. <laughs> All I have to do in valuation is explain what I would pay for the business as a business. And the reality is people are not paying for these teams as businesses, they're paying for them as something else. Okay? In fact, there was an interesting article this morning in the New York Times about Simon Kuznets, Nobel Prize winner, Nobel Economics Prize winner from 1971. Did you read that article? He's actually, his son is actually trying to sell his Nobel Prize. And the article was, and it's actually a good article because it said, pricing a Nobel Prize is really difficult. Why? Because it's, you can't value it. There's no cash flows, right? It's just, and the pricing it is difficult. Why? Because there's not a hefty market for, for in, in Nobel Prizes. In fact, there are like five transactions in like 25 years. And you've got to extrapolate from those five transactions as to what somebody would pay. Okay? But again, it goes to the question of pricing versus valuation and how the two can be very different games. So let's start today with a number that we've talked about discount rates, at least to the point of cost of capital. Today we're going to turn our focus to cash flows. And to get cash flows, we're going to start with earnings. And here's a reality that each of you will face. You will have to value a company as of today. Today being a floating day, depending on when you do the valuation, May 10th, May 9th, May 8th. Which means you want the most updated numbers you can when you do your valuation. I don't care what the value of your company was on January 1st of 2015. You know why? Because there's nothing I can do about it. The only value that matters is the value for today, which leaves you with this quandary. How do I get the most updated earnings I can? Because accountants don't work in continuous time. They work in discrete time. Right? In the US, every three months they might update it, and even that three month update doesn't show up till three or four months after it ends. And outside the US, it can be even more infrequent. You can, get, it, you can get updates only once a year. And February two of a year is actually the worst time of a year to try to value a company. <coughs> February and March is your nightmare scenario. You know why? Because if you're completely dependent on an annual report, it's really old. That annual report is from 2013 not from 2014. Things will look much brighter in April and May, the golden time to do valuation. But the reality is you can't go to your boss and say, look, I'll value companies only in April and May. The rest of the year I'll have to take off because the numbers don't seem updated. You can try, but I'd suggest not. So your reality is you have to value the company at any point in time, including February, using the most updated numbers. So. I'm going to give you suggestions on getting the most updated number. You tell me whether this is a good way to get the most updated earnings for your company. I could use the earnings the last 10K and say, look, I have no choice, which would leave me with 2013 numbers. That is clearly not updated. So if you go that route, you're probably <coughs> going to screw up. Less so in Procter & Gamble and more in Twitter. You see why the younger and higher growth the company is, the more things change in short periods. You can multiply the last 10 Q, which would probably be the September 30th 10 Q by four. Why should you never do that? Seasonality is going to kill you. Strange things happen in quarters. Don't mess with that. So never ever multiply a quarter by four. You can add together the earnings over the last four quarters. That's called what? That's called trailing 12 months. It's actually very easy to do. All you need is a 10 K and a 10 Q. You don't need four 10 Qs. The reason being the most recent 10Q will actually have, let's say the September 30th 10Q, will actually have the first nine months of 2014 and the first nine months of 2013, sheer math. You take the 2013 10K, you subtract out the first three months of 2013, add the first three months of 2014, you're done. In fact, I'll say I'll put out my, my webcast for this week is about creating trailing 12 month numbers. And if you already know how to do it, just skip it. But it's very simple mechanically going through. Caveat I would add is not everything gets updated every quarter. Like options outstanding get updated only in the 10K. So you might have to, so don't let consistency get in the way of saying, look, I, have, I get only December numbers for options. I'm going to stay with December for everything else. Here's your simple rule. You want the most updated numbers you can for every single input. Okay? 
You could take the earnings for the year to date and add an expected earnings. That's the other choice is because remember, we have three quarters of earnings for 2014, right? There are estimates already out there floating around for the fourth quarter. You can add that on. You can do it if you trust the analyst forecast for that quarter. If not, stick with the trailing 12-month numbers. So that's the first thing is try to get the most updated numbers you can. I don't think we'll get to this, but might as well put this on the table. Once you get to earnings, you have to subtract out reinvestment back in the business to get to cash flows. And one of the items we'll have to confront is capital expenditures. Capital expenditures being what you're investing in long-term assets to keep your business growing. So I'm going to ask you, this is a mechanical question, which of these items you would put into CapEx? Building a manufacturing plant. That's a slam dunk, right? How about R&D expenses? What's the definition of CapEx? Go back to accounting 101. Before they screw you up with their rules, they give you first principles. First principle in CapEx is any expense that creates benefits over many years is a CapEx. That's it. You're done. Go back to that rule. What company does R&D expecting to get a benefit in the current year? It's absurd. I mean, forget about pharmaceuticals. Any company that are, this is a super capex, right? In fact, it's way out in the future. But he said, but accountants really not, we'll come back to it because accountants really screw up R&D. And R&D is just the tip of the iceberg. We're going to talk about R&D-like expenses, such as advertising for a consumer product company. Do you see why? What's your biggest asset if you're Coca-Cola? Brand. Brand. And how do you build up your brand name? Partly through advertising. Some of that advertising expense is really a capital expenditure. If you're a consulting firm, your biggest asset is human capital. Some of the recruiting and training expenses you have are really capital expenses. I mean, accounting, as we know, it was designed for the old-time manufacturing company. It's being stretched to breaking point by businesses it was never meant for, which is 80% of the economy now. So we have to clean up after accountants, and especially in that context of it, moving these things from operating to capital expenses. So all of the above are capital expenses. They just don't show up as such in a traditional statement of cash flows. One final item is after you get the operating income, you've got to take taxes out of the operating income. Last session, I talked about the tax rate to use in your cost of debt. When you're doing cost of debt, the tax rate to use is always a marginal tax rate because interest saves you taxes at the margin. What does that mean? Interest saves you taxes at the margin. You have 100 million in income, 10 million in, inter in interest expenses. What do you report as taxable income? 100 minus 10 is 90. Think of where you saved on taxes between the 90 and the 100. Not in the middle 100, not in the first 100. It's your marginal tax rate, which in the US means you're looking at a 40% marginal tax rate. You're saying, but US companies pay only 28% as effective taxes. It doesn't matter. In fact, that is, in fact, why this tax code is so perverse, is you collect 28% of the income in taxes, but at the margin, Apple is claiming a 40% tax saving on its interest expenses. Reggie. I'll tell you why, because when you think about growth, you think about reinvestment. And we're going to make a big deal about connecting the two. If, exactly, exactly. If I let what happens right now pass through, I have no way of even asking the question, is this company investing enough to sustain its growth? That's my problem right now with technology company earnings, is your biggest capex is hidden there. So if a company wants to report, a tech company wants to report higher earnings this year, you know the easiest way to do it is? Cut R&D to zero. Your earnings will pop, and I'll be missing the point that you are cutting the heart out of your business by cutting out your capital expenditures. So you're right, it doesn't change my cash flow this year, but it changes my perspective on whether they can grow in the future. Well, it's all, it starts right at the beginning, right? So when you give me 20% growth for the next five years with any business, the question I ask is, are you investing enough to sustain that growth? With a traditional business, you can show me your capex, you can show me your working capital, you can show me the factories you're building. And I say, okay, I see that. With technology or pharmaceutical companies right now, if you show me a traditional income statement, I have to go into the income statement to figure out whether you have R&D expenses, what the trend line in those R&D expenses, whether you're cutting or not. And that's what I'm doing, is I'm stripping it out of there so that you can't hide behind it. 
And in fact, if you look at recruiting and training expenses, first co costs that get cut at a consulting firm, recruiting and training expenses. Why? Because it makes your earnings look much better. And in the process, you're kind of devastating the future of your business. So you use the marginal tax rate when you do the cost of debt. There's no question about that. Now there's a different reason we'll be talking about taxes to debt. You get the operating income. You have to tell me how much of that operating income you'll pay in taxes. So we're revisiting the question, marginal or effective tax rate. What do you think I should use to come up with the after-tax earnings? Oh, first, of the two tax rates, the one that's usually higher is the marginal tax rate, at least in the U.S., and we'll talk about the difference. But which one of these do you think I should use when I do my cash flows and earnings and cash flows? Marginal or effective? Yeah. And why? Why do we have two sets of rules? What's the difference between interest expense where you said it's always marginal tax rate and earnings where you're willing to go with effective? No, it's also all of your earnings. Remember, the, the, this is the tax rate I'm applying across your entire earnings. The, re the reason I use the marginal tax rate with debt is it saves you taxes at the margin. So one is a, it's across, but even there, the answer cannot stay at the effective tax rate forever. And here's why. If you pay the effective tax rate, you're in effect deferring taxes, right? That's basically what you're doing. And if you assume you can defer taxes forever, that can be a dangerous game as well. So we'll come back and talk about this. But it's a much more debatable question with earnings and cash flows than it is with cost of debt. So let me go back to where we left off in the cost of capital. And I was talking about coming up with the cost of capital. So just, just remind me again, what do we do? We get the cost of equity from, by looking at the beta, the risk free rate, risk premium. We get the cost of debt by, by looking at how much you can borrow at long term today. Then we weight them by how much debt and equity we have and we get a cost of capital, right? And that's nice and easy. So let me muddy the waters a little bit. That assumes there are only two ways of raising money and you tell me whether you're using debt or equity. What if you use convertible debt? What the heck is convertible debt? What's, what's the description? Of, uh, Jeremy, what, what happens to convertible debt? It turns you up to Okay, so there's a bo it looks like a bond until it stops looking like a bond, right? You convert into equity. So convertible debt is part debt, the straight debt portion, and part equity. The conversion option is equity. It's basically a hybrid. You think, what do I do with hybrids? Here's the one thing you should not do. Do not treat convertible debt as a third way of raising financing because it'll only get you into trouble. It'll only get you into trouble because it'll look cheap relative to conventional debt. Do you see why? Because you had a conversion option on the debt, you're going to be able to borrow it. Tesla's convertible debt was at 1%. It's really not even debt. It's really a conversion option almost entirely. So here's what you need to do. I said it's part debt, part equity, right? If you can strip out which part is debt and which part is equity, you're home free because you can take the debt and throw it in with the rest of the debt and the equity and throw it in with the rest of equity. Okay? You might say, look, there's no way I can do this. Okay? So let's assume that I give, you the, I, I give you convertible debt. And I'll go through the process of converting the debt into debt and equity. So let's say the coupon rate on this debt is 4%. Why is it so low? Because it's a convertible bond. Let's say it has a 10-year maturity and a market value 140 million and a face value of only 125 million. So the, the book value of the debt is 125 million. I've given you the coupon rate and I've given you the market value of the debt. What I'd like you to do is take this convertible debt which has a $140 million market value and make some of it into debt and some into equity. I said there are two pieces to a convertible bond, a straight bond and a conversion option, right? Which one's going to be easier to value? The bond, right? Don't go looking for trouble with black shoals and binomial when you don't have to. So here's a very simple way to value the straight bond portion of a convertible bond. Act like there's no conversion option. Say it disappears tomorrow. You know how you'd price the bond? You take the coupon, which is 4% of 125 million. You treat it as a coupon for the remaining 10 years. And the 125 million, which is the face value, becomes the principal. You discount them all back at, that should be at 1.08 raised to the power of 10. I'm sorry, just put a little hood there. Okay. You discount it back at the interest rate this company would borrow at based on its rating, the synthetic or the actual rating. You discount them back. What you get as a present value is 91.45 million. So what does that mean? 
if tomorrow the conversion option disappeared on this bond. Given the fact that the coupon rate is so low, the bond would trade at a substantial discount on face value, trade at 91.45 million. You're almost home free. You take the difference between the 140 million and the 91.45 million, you come up with 48.55 million. That's the value of your conversion option. So what do you do next? This 48.55 million will go to equity. The 91.45 million will go to debt. Your hybrid has just disappeared off your books. You don't have to worry about it. So convertible debt is easy. I'll tell you the hybrid that gives me headaches. It's preferred stock. You know what the problem with preferred stock is? It's really expensive debt without any of the redeeming features of debt. In fact, if you start it from scratch, you say, what idiot would issue preferred stock? Because it looks like that, right? It's in the US, at least, it's a fixed dividend. There's really no price appreciation you're looking at. You're going to get that dividend over the life of the preferred stock, which could be forever. So it looks like a bond. So you're saying, why not treat it as debt? The problem with putting it in with debt, you don't get the tax advantage. You can't treat it as equity because it's really not equity. So preferred stock is the one, one type of capital where I'm willing to make an exception and open up a third source. And here's I think the reason I don't worry about it too much. Who are the biggest issuers of preferred stock in the US? Banks. banks. And why do banks like preferred stock? Given that it's such an inefficient mechanism. Sure one because it counts as part of regulatory capital. Stupid rules create stupid consequences. So the capital guy says, if you issue preferred, we'll treat it as equity. So what do banks do? They issue preferred even though they can't afford the dividend because they can count it as equity. It's incredibly expensive debt. But they do it because it counts as regulatory capital. And with banks, I'm not even going to try to compute a cost of capital. And we'll talk about this later, because with banks, all you're going to stay focused on is the common equity. right? Because there's no such thing as debt at a bank. Debt at a bank is not a source of capital. It's raw material. So when you value banks and insurance companies, because you focus on common equity, preferred stock is not even an issue. It's just a payment you've got to make. But if you have a regular company with preferred stock, then you have no choice but to bring in a third source of capital. And do it only if it's substantial enough that it makes a difference. Any questions? So here's what the cost of capital looks like, you know, bringing everything together. The cost of equity. I'd prefer that you base it on a bottom-up beta with the equity risk premium and risk-free rate in the right currency. The weights should be market value weights, and I'd prefer that you have only two items, debt and equity, but if you preferred stock, add a third. Your cost of debt is the rate at which you can borrow money long-term today, so start with the risk-free rate, add a default spread based on the rating, net out the marginal tax rate because you get the benefit at the margin. You have the after-tax cost of debt. You bring them all together. You have a cost of capital for the company. Any questions about cost of capital? Yes? So the uh, preferred stock, like the, the cost of like preferred stock, would that be just the dividend, Just the yield. And would it be somewhere in between the equity? It'll debt? probably be between the pre-tax cost of debt and the cost of equity. Okay, it, ha it, it has to be, right? Yeah, just the, the, you know, sometimes you get something strange going on, but usually it has to be somewhere in between there. Okay. Yes? You just got, I mean, as an investor, I feel badly for you. But from a corporate finance perspective, it doesn't change anything about it. It's like having a bond where the coup, you don't default. It's basically like a bond where you can't default, right? Basically, that's what it is. It's a bond without the default risk. Maybe that's what. In fact, in many young companies, you see convertible preferred issued by VCs. This is actually not, nothing to do with preferred. It's because they can't attach a number to the company. So what they do is they give the money up front, and then they say the first round, that you actually raise money, we'll negotiate how much of your company. So it's because they're too chicken to actually put a number on the company. So preferred in its different forms, as you see them floating around, be very, step back and look at what actually is being offered by the company, because most of the time it's usually a warrant that they've issued with a little bond at the end. For some reason, US companies seem to have this incredible reluctance to issue warrants. Uh, they treat them as bad instruments, so they add this bond in bond component to make it look like it's a bond with a conversion option. The bond actually is very little of the value. Okay. So now let's talk about cash flows. Okay. Basically, I'm going to take this through three steps. 
I'm going to start off with a number that I've kind of beaten up accountants over, which is accounting earnings. But the reality is if your earnings number is screwed up, your cash flow number is going to be screwed up. So I'm going to talk about cleaning up that number. Then I'm going to look at how much the company is putting back into the business, generically, the reinvestment. Notice I didn't say capex minus depreciation. That might be the way you measure it, but what I'm looking at is what are you putting back into the business? And third step, if it is a cash flow equity, I'm going to look at what cash flows you have to debt. debt. Debt inflows and debt outflows. So three-step process. Let's start with the first one. Okay. Let's just first set the table. There are three ways in which I can estimate cash flows. Let's start with the lazy way. The lazy way is, I don't know what a cash flow is. I'm just going to look at what the actual cash flow. <coughs> dividends, dividends plus free, buys buybacks. Essentially, this is an extension of the old dividend discount model, which is, I don't have the power to estimate cash flows. I don't even know what they are. I'm just going to look at the actual cash flow and stay with it. As we'll see later in, in, this, in this part of the session, that might lead you to some very strange valuations for companies that don't pay out what they can afford to in dividends or buybacks. Okay? The second is to estimate what your company could have paid in dividends. I call it a potential dividend, but I give this fancy name, free cash flow equity. I'm very wary of the word free cash flow because I know all its different forms. People define it differently. But free cash flow equity to me is the cash left over after you've met every conceivable need. Capital expenditures, working capital, debt payments. The way I, I think about it is if you ran a business, this is the cash left in the till at the end of the year after you've covered every other need. So you can take it out of the business without hurting the business. So that's potential dividend. And the third definition of cash flow is cash flows the entire business, free cash flow to the firm. The big difference between free cash flow equity and free cash flow of the firm is the starting point, instead of being net income, is after-tax operating income. So you're looking at the entire business. And you don't subtract out the debt portions when you do free cash flow to the firm. So take the actual cash return, free cash flow equity or free cash flow to the firm. But if you go the free cash flow equity or free cash flow to the firm route, the starting point for both is accounting earnings. Operating income in one, net income in the other. So here are the here are the basic things that I want to start out with. Let me first put up the free cash flow to the firm equation. And I want to first get deal with something that continues to bother people even after they've been doing valuation for a while. When you do free cash flow to the firm, here's how you compute it. You start with the earnings before interest and taxes or operating income. You act like you pay taxes in the operating income. You never subtract out actual taxes paid. You subtract out what you would have paid as taxes on that operating income. That's why it's called an unlevered cash flow. And you subtract out the reinvestment in the form of net capex and changing working capital to get to free cash flow to the firm. So what I'm asking you to do is act like you have no interest expenses. But don't interest expenses save you taxes? That's not a hypothetical, right? That's a real saving. I'm saying don't count it in your cash flows. So let's assume, let me play devil's advocate. It's six months out and nine months out. We're talking about evaluation, you bring this concept up, and I say, you know what, those savings are real savings. How come you're not counting it in the cash flows? What's your response? It because it gets discounted back at what? The cost of capital. What goes into cost of capital? A cost of equity and a after-tax cost of debt. The tax savings from debt in a traditional discounted cash flow valuation we use cost of capital is in the discount rate. If you count the tax savings in your cash flows as well, you're double counting. And the next DCF you look at, take a close look, because I've seen people take operating income and subtract out cash taxes paid. If you do that, you've just double counted, because those cash taxes paid are going to be lower if you have a lot of interest expenses. So that's the reason we don't count the tax savings. because we don't, It's not because we don't care about it. It's because it's already embedded in the discount rate. So let me go through the process of getting the earnings number right. So you, the, the, this is the base number. You want to make sure that your base number is OK, because you're building a castle on top of that base number. So there are three things I suggest you do almost routinely with every company. Do it for every company, because otherwise you get lazy, and then you forget to do it. First, make sure this is the most updated number you can get, because you want to value as of today. And we'll talk about the trailing 12-month numbers and what to do if you're in a market where, where you don't have full quarterly reports, because you often, that's often the problem. Second. If your company is a commodity company or a cyclical company, be very careful about using last year's numbers. In fact, I'll tell you up front that if you're valuing an oil company and you're using 2013 numbers, don't do your valuation. I'll, you're going, I'll, I'll tell you exactly what you're going to find. 
Every oil company looks like a bargain. You know why? Because 2013 earnings reflect oil prices of $100 a barrel. You're in a market where oil prices are fighting to get to $50 a barrel. Your number's off. So it's common sense. You can't use last year's earnings. You want to normalize the number, right? Remember I said don't normalize risk-free rates? That, that rule still applies. But when you talk about earnings, this is your company because you're projecting off that base. You have to normalize. So if I give you 10 years of earnings and they're up and down, common sense normalization might say take the average earnings over 10 years. The only problem with taking average earnings is if your company size is changing, taking average dollar earnings doesn't work. You might take the average margin over 10 years and apply it to revenue today. In other words, there's no one template I can give you for normalizing, but one thing I'm saying is if you have a commodity or cyclical company, don't build a valuation of last year's numbers. It's asking for trouble. And finally, you've got to clean up after your accountants. Clean up in what sense? I think accountants routinely miscategorize one capex, R&D, as an operating expense. I've got to clean up for that. They also routinely miscategorize one financial expense as an operating expense, and I'm talking about leases, that I'm going to clean up for that. And I do this routinely for every company. You're saying, why do you wait for accountants to come to their senses? Why? First, we have no idea whether they will ever come to their senses on some of these items. Two, by the time they finish the debate, you still have to be valuing companies. So here's the first, first point I want to make. It's, let's start with updating the earnings. Okay? Updating the earnings is as simple as using trailing 12-month numbers, and all you need is a 10K and a 10Q if you're in the US. Outside the US, things get messier, especially in Europe. It's surprising. Many emerging markets are ahead of mainland Europe in terms of full financial statements. Every year, you, every quarter, you get a statement. Much of mainland Europe, instead of getting the full quarterly statements, you get pieces. Revenues, operating income, they'll give you five items. Which means you can update only some numbers, you can't update others. But remember what I said. You want the most updated number you can for each input. So as you go down the spreadsheet, if I ask you what the T-bond rate is, don't give me the T-bond rate as of September 30th, 2014, because that's when the accounting statements ended. Give me the T-bond rate as of right now. It's the most updated number. You get to the revenues, I ask you what are the revenues. You might give me, give me the trailing 12 months through September 30th. You might say, that doesn't match. It does. You're giving me the most updated accounting number you have for revenues. So for each item, give me the most updated number you can. And if you feel that that number is old and you can update it with an unofficial estimate, for instance, with options for companies doubling the number of options, even though you might not see the number, you might say, I've doubled the options because revenues have doubled. I'll take that over a stale old number. So I'd much rather that you get an updated kind of shaky number than a stale old number, especially with young companies. So that's the first stop. Any questions on updating your numbers? Okay. Let's talk about cleaning up after accountants. Okay. I'll give you the way I visualize accounting first principles. Right? You have three class of expenses. You have operating expenses, capital expenses, and financial expenses. Accounting first principles, here's what's supposed to go into each. Operating expenses are expenses designed to create a benefit only in the current year. Raw materials, labor. Capital expenses are expenses designed to create benefits over many years. Of course, factories, but R and I mean, so we talked about R and D and advertising. Financial expenses are exp expenses associated with the use of debt or debt-like instruments. So, if accounting did things right, there should be no capital expenses or financial expenses to get to operating income. So, when you go revenues to operating income, you should have revenues minus operating expenses. Capital expenses from previous periods will show up as depreciation and amortization, and financial expenses show up below the operating income line. And that's where the problems start, because there are these two items that consistently get miscategorized. One is leases, the other is R&D. Let's start with leases. First, if you look across sectors, in some sectors it's a non-issue, but you look at restaurants or retailing, this is the percentage of overall operating income that operating leases are. So you look at these businesses, this is a big expense. It is, in fact, their biggest expense. And right now, it's being treated as an operating expense. What's the accounting categorization between a capital lease and an operating lease? What, what is it that they use? Yeah, 
it, they all rest on ownership, basically. That's, that's the accounting fulcrum. If you own an asset, it is a capital asset. If you don't own an asset, so if you go lease a car from an auto dealer and you don't have the option to buy the car at the end of five years, the accountant will treat it as an operating lease expense, but if you have the option to buy the car, you will treat it as a capital expense. So ownership is the, which makes absolutely no sense because debt is a contractual commitment. There's no ownership component to it. I don't even know why this is a debate. The very fact that we debate this is more revealing of accounting shortcomings than anything to debate. Okay. So leases are debt, period. Uh, operating a capital. Finally, accountants are coming to their senses on this. There's actually, I think, FASB is going to try to change the rule in 2016. IFRS is going to try to do the same thing. The reason I say try is to get massive pushbacks from the retail companies and the restaurant companies, just as they did with options being expensed. It'll take, I'll make a prediction it won't happen in 2016. If we're lucky, it might happen in 2023 because that's how long the process works. So leases are debt, and it's my job to convert them to debt. And it's not difficult to do. So I'm going to take you through the process of converting leases to debt. So yeah. the reason they don't want to do it is because it will make their balance sheets it'll look make their in, It'll make their income statements they'll, they'll and balance sheets look much. They, they look more levered than they are. They'll actually look as levered as they really are. But the which is, isn't affected. The income statement will be changed because what's operating income and what's net income will not be affected, but the operating income will be. Wouldn't that be better for them? We'll talk about that. There, there, I call this the, I actually took the gap through this process and there were stages of delirium. But at some stages we were tremendously happy about what I was doing and other stages they had a complete letdown. You're right, some things will look better, some, but the thing that worries them is the, the, is the balance sheet leverage that will show up. So let's go through the process of conver converting leases to debt. Somebody back there had a question? Okay. So here's what I'm going to do. I want to convert operating leases to debt. It's not this year's lease expense that bothers me. It's a commitment you've entered into to make these lease payments in the future, right? And here's where the raw data helps me. In the US, if you have lease commitments, what are you required to do? You have to disclose them in a footnote. In fact, you take a company, type in rental or lease commitments, it should show up if it does. And here's what you show in the footnotes. Lease commitments due in year one, year two, year three, year four, year five. And beyond year five, you show a lump sum. These are not expected lease payments. These are contractual commitments you've already signed. And I want to convert them to debt. How do I compute the market value of a bond? What do I do? I take the contractual commitments on the bond, and I discount those contractual commitments back at the pre-tax cost of debt, and I have the market value of debt, right? It's as simple as that. You give me the lease commitments, I take the present value of those lease commitments, and I come up with the present value, that's the debt value of leases. You say, I'm done. Not quite. Because the minute you decide to convert lease commitments to debt, you've got to redo your financials, right? Because you are subtracting out the operating lease expense to get to operating income. And now I'm saying, no, 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 that's not an operating expense. So you're going to add that lease expense back, but you can't stop that. Remember that lease commitment I created as debt I put on my balance sheet? The balance sheet is this very unpleasant requirement, which is it has to balance. Which means if I put a billion on the liability side as debt, I have to create a counter asset of a billion, which then I have to, what happens when you have an asset in the subsequent periods? I have to depreciate. This is like give a mouse a cookie time. Have you read that book? Read it. It's a classic. Okay, basically in the story, the mouse comes in, this kid offers the mouse a cookie. The mouse spills a cookie all over and he wants a bath. So he's in the bath next. He wants a glass of milk. And before you know, the whole book is about one thing after the other. The same thing is true for leases. You convert leases to debt, you're not done. Your operating income is going to be different. You depreciate. But get used to it. You're getting a more realistic sense of what this company would look like if you treated its debt as debt. So the way you adjust the operating income is you add back the lease expense because you never should have subtracted out. And you subtract out the depreciation you'd have had in the leased asset, which is a monstrous headache because you can go dancing the sum of the year digits, double declining balance. My suggestion is keep it simple. What's the simplest depreciation method you can use? Straight line. Straight line. Why go looking for trouble? In fact, there's a shortcut I'm going to suggest if you really don't want to deal with the depreciation. It works pretty well. It's not going to give you the same answer. Which instead of going through this entire process, here's what you do. 
you start with the original operating income and you add back the interest expense you'd have had if you'd been treating leases as debt. I call this an imputed interest expense. It's not the same answer, but it's a shortcut that works pretty well. So you ready? Let's try this. Take the gap in 2003. Big retailer, right? The Gap doesn't own a single one of its stores, not one. Every single store that The Gap has is a lease store. Six-year leases, eight-year leases, 10-year leases. Those are the lease commitments for the next five years. And beyond year five, they gave me a lump sum, like all companies do, of 1,975 million, or somewhere around there. Now, there are two choices you can do with the lump sum. You can say, I don't know what happens after year six. I'm going to treat it all as coming in in year six. But here's what I prefer to do. I take the average lease commitment over the first five years. So let's suppose the average lease commitment over the first five years is 750 million. I look at the lump sum, and I try to make my best judgment as to how many years are captured in the lump sum. Nobody knows, because companies don't have to report it. Make your best judgment. Because once you've done that, the rest is trivial. I discount back the commitments using my pre-tax cost of debt. So do the actual or synthetic rating first before you get to the lease part because otherwise you're going to be spinning. Okay? You get the, you take the, the pre-tax cost of debt, you discount the cash, the lease commitments back. Including the lump sum at the end, you add them all up and the debt value of leases at the gap is $4.4 .4 billion. Think of what I've just done. I've just redone the gap's balance sheet and said, you know what? You got $4.4 .4 billion of additional debt, which is lease debt. Now here comes the operating income adjustment. The debt outstanding at the gap jumps by almost 200%. So instead of thinking they owe $2 billion, I now recognize them as owing $6.4 billion. The operating income, which was $1.012 billion before, I add back the lease expense for the current year, saying I shouldn't have subtracted out. And I divide the $4.4 billion by 7. Do you see why 7? Because in my li lifespan, at least, I've used a 7-year life for the leases. I use the same life for the asset. I'm trying to keep my life as simple as I can. So my adjusted operating income is $1.276 billion. So at this stage, I don't blame you if you're confused. So you're saying, what direction is this pulling me? First, my debt goes up. My operating income goes up. There's good news. There's bad news. What's the net news? And that's exactly the question I got from the Gap about 10 years ago. Is they said, can you come in and talk to our management? Because they actually saw this coming in 2007. It shows you how much this has been delayed over time. They said, can you come in and talk to us about what will happen to our financials if we're required to capitalize leases. So I went in and with a table where I compared what they look like now with their existing accounting and what they would look like if I capitalized leases. And as I said, they went through various stages of delirium during this process. And you're going to see why. I said, let me start with the really good news first. So left column is conventional accounting. The right column is what you will look like if I capitalize leases. The good news is you're actually a lot more profitable than you let on. They said, this is good, this is good, keep going. The reason you're more profitable is I add back the lease expense and subtract other depreciation. The operating income jumps from 1.012 to 1.362. Big jump in operating income. Then I said, there is one little catch you're on your balance sheet right now. You have off balance sheet debt. This is essentially what operating leases have been. I'm going to bring it on balance sheet. So at this stage, they're getting a little worried. That's a lot of debt. I said, that's good news. They said, how can that be good news? I said, when I do your cost of capital, so the weighted average of cost of equity and cost of debt, because you have more debt than I thought you did, and I bring that in, debt has a lower cost, my cost of capital for you is only 6.25%. At this stage, they were hitting the roof. Higher operating income, lower cost of capital, everything is coming up roses here. I said there's one final hammer that has to drop here. Your value as a company is a function not just of your cost of capital, but of how much you earn as a return on your investments. And your conventional measure of return, you take the operating income after taxes, and you divide by the book value of capital, one of the few places where we use book value. In the old accounting system, when I did book value of capital, I counted only the conventional debt, so it looked like you were making 12.9%. But when I treat leases as debt, and I bring them into the invested capital, it looks like you're making only 9.3%. At this stage, they were completely confused. They said, well, what's the bottom line? Will our value go up or down? I'm going to throw that question to you. Is there any way you can answer that question with these numbers? <coughs> What's the driver of the value of growth? What do you make over and above the cost of capital, right? With the conventional accounting, it looks like they're making about 5.6%. 
When I capitalize leases, even though the cost of capital dropped, the return on capital dropped even more. I, I, I can make a guess here, but my guess is when I capitalize lease of the gap, the value per share is going to go down. In fact, I did this across retail companies. For about a third of the companies, the value went up. Two thirds of companies, the value. This is not unmitigated bad news. Some companies are going to look better than you thought they are after you capitalize leases. So if this rule is actually going to come into play and most of the market is going to be surprised after the fact, you can get ahead of this game. There's no reason to be surprised here. We know exactly what's going to happen because accountants have been treating capital leases, doing what I did for operating leases for as long as I remember, 20 years or so. This is going to bring them all under the same rules. So capitalizing leases changes your vision of the company. It has more operating income because you're treating it as more debt funded. When you value the company, you come up with a bigger value for the operating assets. Don't be surprised because then when you subtract out debt, you're also going to be subtracting out a much larger debt value. The companies where this, this conversion is, is scariest are companies that actually look good on a conventional accounting basis, earn more than their cost of capital. But then when you capitalize leases, they flip. You know what I mean by flip? They go from looking like they earn more than the cost of capital to earning less than the cost of capital. If they're high growth companies, this is like throwing gasoline on a fire. You take, earn less than your cost of capital, you're opening 100 new stores every year. You're on a pathway to destruction, which is what Starbucks was on in 2008 and 2009. You know how many Starbucks there are in New York City? I don't have the exact number now, but it used to be 172 Starbucks. That's why you take your phone and you point it around. You find a T-Mobile. Is there still T-Mobile at Starbucks? Whatever it is, you, you can always find the nearest Starbucks. It's within half a block of you. 172 Starbucks just in New York City. They were opening stores like they were going out of style. And in 2008, when you computed the return on capital using conventional accounting, they looked good. But when you capitalized leases, the bottom fell out. It took them about a year later to discover that things were out of control. That's when Howard Schultz come back, came back and they took over the company again, tried to change it. But that's why we capitalize leases, to get a sense of, is this company growing well? Is it creating value? To answer the question, I have to capitalize leases. Yes? Can you explain again why uh, net income doesn't change? Uh, because, because right now, what are we doing? We're subtracting out operating lease expenses to come, come up to operating income and then yep. subtracting out it. When we capitalize leases, we replace the operating lease expense with two expenses. One is, of course, the interest expense you'd have had in the debt. The other is the depreciation. Yes. And the way we structure it is the sum of those two expenses has to be equal to your operating expense. Because I can't change what you actually pay out. So what I'm doing is taking that $3 billion you have as operating lease expense and replacing it $1.8 billion in interest expense and $1.2 billion in, and, f and because net income is after both expenses, it doesn't change. So operating income will go up, but net income cannot be affected. Yep, but so I, I, I got all yeah. that. I, I just don't, like, mechanically, how would you get it so that the two numbers, like, you use one no, because, as a plug? Exactly. You'd have to use one as a plug to get into the other, because that's exactly what you're doing, is you're taking the total expense, you're saying it's a financial expense, part of it is interest and part is principal, if you prefer to think of it that way. If I know what the interest expense is, the balance is principal, the principal and the depreciation have to even out. So basically, that's what you do is you use that as your plug number. Okay. Then, because that's what they do in capital expenses right now, too. That's how they do the plugs. Right. And then the other question was uh, for the cost of capital. Right. If you include the, the leases in your debt, uh, are you assuming that the interest payments are like tax deductible? Oh, they are. Lease okay. expenses are tax deductible. Oh, yeah. So, so all you're do doing is, again, replacing one tax deductible lease expense with two tax deductible. With, with R&D, this is going to be an issue. Because right. we're going to replace it partially with a non-tax deductible expense. With the leases, I don't have to. Yes? But isn't, isn't the tax rate different? Like, one is a marginal tax rate, one is a... No, 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 no. Because, because, oh, you're saying with the interest expenses are tax deductible? You might move the interest expenses to try to get the maximum tax deduction. but. At the, if you're doing an, a, a total income statement, because remember, you're doing the total income statement using the marginal tax rate gets hidden in a total income statement because yeah. you don't really realize what you're paying the marginal tax on, what you're not. So even with regular interest expenses, when you look at a traditional income statement, you're not going to see that marginal tax effect explicitly. It's implicitly showing up in that taxable income and taxes you pay. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's why it's not as big a deal. I, I can understand your point about it. 
effective versus marginal tax rate, but I don't think it's much of an issue here. And so in this case, the interest expense, you, you said that is a plug, right? Because depreciation is straight line. Interest, interest expense can be a plug or depreciation can be a plug. You can choose which one you want to be a plug, How right? Do you do that? Well, because the interest expense, you take the pre-tax cost of debt, you multiply by the dollar debt, you get an interest expense. So I can get, I can get it one way or the other, okay. but the sum of those two numbers has to be equal to the operating lease expense because that's what you actually paid out. I can't change that actuality. All I can do is reshuffle the numbers. Yeah. So do you like bump up the pre-tax cost of debt because like you're assuming that's that that's a good question. It's a, did everybody get this question? Because this is a question for this week's weekly challenge, which I haven't been trying for the last four weeks, but I will throw it out anyway. Um, it's about how you get the cost of debt for a company with a lot of lease commitments. If it has an actual rating, what are you hoping? That the ratings agency actually has, ref because it's supposed to, ratings agency is supposed to take into account lease commitments when they do. So if it's an actual rating, you're hoping and praying that you're okay because it already reflects it. If it's a synthetic rating, you're in a little bit of trouble, right? Because the interest coverage ratio if you use conventional interest expenses for a gap will look very good. So, in my, in my synthetic rating spreadsheets, I actually take leases and I, sp it, it requires some circular reasoning, but I actually convert it into debt, put in the interest expenses, which takes care of the fact that if you have a lot of leases, I should be giving you a lower rating and a higher cost of debt. But that, try the weekly challenge because it forces you to kind of confront that. Yes, Rajiv? Yeah, so on an unlimited basis, yeah. you are in a business that is here that is property. Should you capitalize operating leases, you basically just add in a so wouldn't that, in theory, just lower your No, but if you don't have ownership rights, that's where it becomes significant, right? Because you, if you invest in real estate, but you don't get any appreciation of the real estate, you will get no value from that real estate. Like if my lease is structured on a fixed term basis where the property prices go up, the market goes to go up, yeah, yeah. and so therefore I'm exposed to the property market indirectly. You are, and that, should be, and that should be true for every real estate company, I'm sorry, every retail company, part of whether you were capitalizing leases or not, that was already embedded as one of the risks you had to deal with. It was just hidden. So would the market have baked that into existing unrated it, that's, that's the question. Is the market already doing it? Is it captured? And that's what you're hoping for, that on average they are. And we find out after they actually start capitalizing the leases, if you see a significant change in betas, it's because the market was not doing it right in the first place. But then as a follow-up to that, yeah. Because you have a fixed commitment but to make, right? Well, you're talking about, but then we're debating whether it's closer to unsecured or secure debt. It's yeah. about where it falls. Yeah. That's an argument for saying maybe the discount rate I should be using on leases should be closer to an unsecured cost of debt rather than a secured cost. So that really is more a question of what the right discount rate to apply to the commitment is. Here's one thing, though, that you should not do that I've seen some accountants who borrowed this concept try to do, which is replace contractual lease commitments with expected lease commitments. You see what I mean? Which is if you're going to be growing, then your lease pay, why do, and the reason you don't do that is for the same reason I don't count in debt you will take on two years from now to build a new factory as debt outstanding today. So when you build it into the debt ratio and you're growing your company, you're assuming your lease debt will already grow over time. And if you count and you expect it, addition to the lease, you actually double count. Okay? So just stay with the actual contractual commitments and take the present right. Yeah. Now, before I leave this, this concept though, what is it about lease commitments that make them like debt? Because you've got to make them in good times and you've got to make them in bad times. You have a little wiggle room, but that's what it is, right? If you open up uh, Netflix's 10K, anybody doing Netflix? Yeah? Take, up net, net, take a look at Netflix's 10K. You'll see that commitment table, you'll see lease commitments, you'll see what you write next to it, another set of commitments. It's a broadcasting commitments. They vastly exceed the lease. So for Netflix, these broad broadcasting commitments are contractual commitments. So when you capitalize those broadcasting commitments in Netflix, it's going to give you a very different vision of what the company looks like in terms of leverage. Than what you, so this is not just about leads, it's about any kind of contractual commitment. So we're valuing the Yankees today. What's my big off-balance sheet debt? He just came into spring <coughs> training yesterday, carrying a big box on his shoulder. 
How much do I owe, owe A Rod as a Yankee? Uh, as the Yankees, what is sixty-six million over the next three years? Something with some absurd amount. And the problem is they have no <coughs> escape hatches. They can cut him, but they still have to pay him sixty-six million. That's the equivalent of debt. If you're valuing the Yankees today, the present value of Tanaka's contract, which is what? How many years does he have left? Right, one hundred and fifty million over was it six years? Something like that. Is five years left, 125 million, that's debt for them. Because it's a contractual commitment from which there is no escape hatch. Okay. So that's the, R, the, the, the least part. If there are none, let's talk about R&D. Again, it varies across businesses, right? If you have pharmaceuticals, it could be a big factor. Technology, it could be big. Petroleum, what R&D is there in petroleum? What's the analogous expense to R&D in, uh, in oil company income statements? Exploration costs, they do exactly the same thing to exploration costs as they do to R&D. So in some sectors, it is a big item. And here again, I've never understood why accountants do what they do. Or maybe I do and I just don't like it. <laughs> Which is there is no conceivable economic rationale <coughs> for expensing R&D. In fact, I was at the AICPA conference <laughs> about five years ago. It was in Las Vegas, which is to begin with a contradictory venue for a group of accountants to talk about how to account for things right. But they have the biggest conference rooms. So I had a thousand accountants in the room and I give a talk, and this is very close to my vision of hell. A thousand accountants and me in one room, right? <laughs> <laughs> but my reaction is, what's the worst thing? They can gang audit me, okay? You know, go <laughs> ahead. No. So basically, I, you know, I, I got up there and I was in a really crotchety mood that day. So I said, these are the 10 things that accounting does that really, really bother me. And I'll list, I won't list the other nine, but one of them was, what the heck are you guys doing with R&D expenses? Why do you expense them? And of course, they came out with the accounting reasons. Let's see if you can, you can list what the accountants list as reasons for expensing R&D. Why do they expense R&D? Given that there's no logic you can give for it, what's the rationale? Yeah. <coughs> The benefits are too uncertain. I said, okay. What if I build a factory in Kazakhstan? Like Borat could come in and burn it down tomorrow. Strange things can happen, right? All kinds of stuff can happen. There are parts of the world where if I build a factory, it's very uncertain. You don't let me expense it. What if HP decides to build another tablet factory? Remember the last tablet they came out with? It lasted, what, two weeks before they pulled it off the market? Extremely uncertain that they can make it. In other words, Uncertainty has never been the dividing line. If I build a factory, why is it magically a dividing line when I do R&D? So that rationale makes no sense. <coughs> what else do you think they came up with? Think like an accountant. I know it will twist your brain, but, but go there for a moment, then come back. Yeah. It's a, like a slippery slope argument. In other words, they said, we're just being conservative. Yeah, and then once you do this, you'll like capitalize. Yeah, and you say, if we, if we, I said, are you really being conservative? Is it really conservative to expense R&D? Let's first see the sense in which you are reporting lower income for companies with a lot of R&D, right? So that's, but when you expense something, what do you show on the balance sheet? In fact, you don't show anything. That's the problem, is by expensing things, you've taken your biggest assets off the books. And what do we use to measure how good a company's projects are? We take the income and we divide it by the okay. invested capital. You've taken your biggest asset off the books. Every technology company looks like it's creating 60, 70% returns. We know it's a complete lie, but by doing what you've done, you've actually created numbers that are not conservative. There is no good reason. <coughs> for doing what they're doing with R&D, none. I'll make a prediction, about 2023 or so, you will hear talk about, oh, we need to do something about R&D. The problem with accounting though is, lots of problems, but this is one, is you have a legacy problem. Legacy problem in the sense you have a whole bunch of accounting that you develop for the manufacturing firm, and you can't throw it out, because if you throw it out, what are you doing? You're making all those CPAs that people have collected over the last 40 years useless, right? It's a very selfish reason because you can't abandon your legacy, so what they have to do is tweak at the edges. And that will never work here. You almost have to go back to ground zero, like baseline budgeting. You've got to start with ground zero and build up. And building it up is not that difficult. To capitalize R&D, here's what I need to do. You're a company with a lot of R&D. I'm going to come to you with a question. 
on average, how long does it take between the time you do R&D and a commercial product emerges? Notice how it's through the on average. I know some of your R&D will not pay off. Some might pay off in three, some might in seven. So just give me a, an average number, eight, ten. And most pharmaceutical companies can give you a pretty good median period for when, so you're a pharmaceutical company, it's probably going to be ten years if you're lucky because of three stages of the approval process. I'm off to the races. Because here's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to collect your R&D expenses every year for the last 10 years. You say, why? Because if I decide that R&D has a 10-year life, what's the next logical step is to take the R&D expenses and spread it out over 10 years. And I've got to keep track of each one. So let me take an example. Let's take SAP, German software company, right? There's R&D. It's not like a pharmaceutical company. It's not going to take it 10 years, but it's a pretty long term because it does business software. They actually take a while to test things out before they release them. So I gave them a five-year life. I collected the R&D expenses for this year and the last five years. When I say this year, I'm assuming it ended yesterday. So that R&D expense happened yesterday, so I can't really amortize it yet. But the R&D expense from five years ago, the 745 million, I write off one-fifth each year. And I'm writing off the last fifth this year, so it's gone from the books. R&D from four years ago, I write off one-fifth, and there's one-fifth left over. R&D from three years ago, I write off one-fifth, and I keep track of both what I'm writing off, which is always one-fifth, and what's left over, which is going to be higher for the more recent R&D expenses. See, so where is this going? If I add up this, the, the, the second to last column, I come up with 2.914 billion euros. So you're saying, what the heck is that? That is the capital I've invested in R&D over the last five years that I haven't written off. It's going to show up in my balance sheet as an asset. So remember, balance sheets have to balance. So I have only two items on the other side of the balance sheet, debt or equity. So which one am I going to increase by 2.9 billion? Where did the money for this R&D come from? It came out of equity earnings. So my book value of equity will increase by 2.9 billion. That's the number that's going to feed into my return on equity and return on capital. It changes again the way I think about the company. My research asset, that amortization is now going to show up as depreciation. My operating income is going to increase by 117 million because I'm going to add back the R&D expense and subtract out the amortization. As with the gap, let me take you through the table. So when I capitalize R&D for, the, for SAP, their operating income goes up. And here I do have a tax problem. Here's the tax problem. Right now, what am I deducting for taxes? The entire R&D expense, right? I'm replacing that R&D expense with an amortization of the R&D expense, and the rest is capital expenses. And because the amortization is less than the R&D expense, I'm losing some tax benefits when I do this conversion. And I don't want to, because the tax law remains what it is, which is I get to serve. So the way you adjust for it is actually to, to capture that additional tax benefit and bring it back. So based on this, my operating income both before and after taxes goes up by 117 million. So my operating income increases by 117 million. My capex is now higher because I'm going to add back the R&D to my capex. My depreciation is higher because I'm going to add the amortization. My net capex increases by 117 million. And this is the point that Rajiv was making earlier. Is if my after tax operating income increases by 117 million, and my net capex increases by 117 million, my free cash flow doesn't change. And that should be no surprise. You wrote the check out to R&D. What changes is my sense of how much you're putting back in the business. So if you're a growing business, I can now, you know, accountants have their shortcuts for doing this. They compute EBIT, uh, you know, EBIT before depreciation, amortization, and R&D. That's a shortcut that you can try to use. But that's what they're trying to do. Is they're saying, look, this isn't fair. I personally think that this is a huge problem in markets. And when I compare the PE ratio for G and the PE ratio for Microsoft right now, I'm comparing apples and oranges. Because one earnings is with traditional conventional accounting treating CapEx, right? And the other one is with it treating R&D as, as an operating expense, when in fact it's a capital expense. It's a problem that's cutting across markets that is creating some, and, and I think that's part of the reason when you see the Schiller PE, you've got to be a little more cautious because 25 to 30 years ago, thing in 1984, which is, I was actually, I'm putting a blog post on this, technology was 4% of the S&P 500. Today it's 21% of the S&P 500. You're saying, so what? This earnings problem is going to show up as an earnings number. We're computing PE ratios across time. 
we're actually measuring a different type of earnings now than we did 25 years ago. Yes, please. Um, what happens with capitalizing capital development costs? How does that factor into the Same thing. If you, it, here's the key, though. You have to show me that there is a period of time between. So if your development costs show up, so if, you do, if, you're, if your time frame for development is six months and you go to the market right away, there is no need to capitalize. If your development period takes three or four or five years, then we can start talking capitalization. In fact, this is an argument that a lot of these social media companies are now using for adding back customer acquisition costs. Groupon tried this, right? You see what the rationale is? Our big capex is getting new customers. 50% of our expenses are customer acquisition costs. Groupon claimed to be making money when it went public. So I actually posted on it, say, hey, you have lo your logic is good, but there is, I think, a piece missing. If you decide to capitalize customer acquisition costs, first, what do you have to show me? That a customer you acquire does what? Hang around. So I said, can you give me some statistics on how long a customer you get with these Groupon little promotion stays? They said, we don't have that information. I said, okay, that undercuts your rationale for making the Second, assuming they come back with two years or three years, they're not talking about 15 years now. You know what the next step is? I'd be adding back the customer acquisition cost, but then I'll have to be you know, looking at past expenses. You can't just add the expense back, which is this adjusted EBITDA problem. You add back anything you don't like. It's, I don't like that. Let me add that back. You can't do that. If you're going to go do this, you've got to go the distance. Question. Now let me ask you a question. Did you pay with intangible cash when you did R&D or tangible cash? That's the only thing that matters, in a cash flow basis. You get a different kind of asset, but from a cash flow perspective, do you see why the physicality of the asset doesn't matter? If I pay my researchers cash, it's a cash outflow. But from right? a balance sheet perspective. See, the way accountants do balance sheets, it's a problem, right? Because they are well caught up in this, and I think that's a, pr that's a problem they'll have to deal with. Because increasingly the world is becoming intangible. And intangible assets are no more or no less risky than tangible assets. You give me a patent which has a solid market. It's a much more predictable, <coughs> stable value than if you give me a nuclear power plant which has a damage in it. Right? Huge physical asset, no value. So I think for a long time we've treated tangible assets as easy to value and more stable and intangible assets as more difficult. I think those days are long since done. So if that is the rationale for doing what you're doing for R&D, it's going to create a whole host of other troubles for you down the road. But I agree with you. That's one of the things that trips up accountants is this physicality issue. Is it a tangible asset or an intangible? But from a cash flow perspective, I really don't care. Right? If that's the way you create growth, is investing in customers who are around five years, uh, Netflix would have a case for doing this, right? Because it's well established that when you, when you become a Netflix customer, even if you never watch Netflix, you forget to cancel the subscription. It's a well established fact that subscription based services, once you join, you actually get this staying on rate. That I've had the Skype premium thing that I've been meaning to cancel for two and a half years, <laughs> which reminds me, after class today, first thing I'm going to do is canceling it. <laughs> Paying like $10 a month for two and a half years. Like the three hundred dollars I've been paying because I've been too lazy to. No, never mind. It was going to piss me off. No way. So, operating income increases and. Yeah, um, I have a question about the ignore tax benefit. So the reason why we add forty three back to right. to, to the uh, adjust EBIT is because uh, even though after capitalizing all the R R and E um, on the book, our expenses goes yeah, down. Yeah, but when yeah, you fire the tax yeah, returns. Exactly. Virus, exactly. You know what? Technology companies should hope and pray that the tax law doesn't change. Because this is great that I get to deduct my entire CapEx okay. right away. So that's what I'm trying to capture is the tax law is not changing. It's my perception okay. of the company that I'm changing. Okay? Just hope and pray the IRS doesn't see it and say, that's a good idea. Let's do this. Because then, then your tax benefits will start to look like more conventional assets. Okay. Okay? Now the balance sheet, the book equity goes up. CapEx the, you know, jumps, but the free cash flow doesn't change. And my return on capital for the company, and you're going to see this in much more depth when we value pharmaceutical company. I'll value Amgen later in the class. You're going to see that it's going to change my vision of the company and the value that I attach to the company. For some companies, the value will go up when I capitalize R&D. Other companies will go down. I'll give you a clue as to what's going to drive this. Is R&D 
a good thing or a bad thing? When you see a company investing in R&D, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Let me rephrase the question. If you have a manufacturing company, if it's building factories, is that a good thing or a bad thing? It depends, right? It depends on what? Whether those factories make sense, whether you're earning good. The same answer applies for R&D. There is nothing about R&D that's noble. If you're a Merck stockholder, you know how much you've spent in R&D over the last decade? More than a hundred billion dollars. You know what you have to show for it? Absolutely nothing. Merck would be worth a lot more money. Tomorrow they said, we're eliminating R&D entirely. We're sending all our researchers home. White House Station will shut down because what are all those people now going to do? But you're, you're not even running in place. You're running backwards, right, when you do R&D? So that's the reason we capitalize R&D is to bring that factory. Yeah. What was the two million on the side? That, that was the original net. So if, in the statement of cash flows, that's what they claimed the net capex was that they were. So it's a tr the accounting definition of capex, land building equipment. Oh. The company was doing almost nothing. Yeah. Yes, Patrick. Is the ignored tax benefit based on marginal or effective tax rate? That's a good question. I use the effective tax rate again to make my numbers match up, right? Because otherwise I'll end up with a different operating income. Now let's, yeah, go ahead. Um, if you start an R&D project or you see it on right. the financial statement, you're not sure ultimately how much you take off year after year. You're just starting out. Then your, your estimation will change. Will change over time. It's, 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 a, re, it's a reality. That's part of the, it's part of reality, right? I mean, it might as well reflect that reality. If you're a pharmaceutical company with a very stable fixed R&D stream, you might be very different. I have to treat you differently than one whose you know, numbers keep jumping around because the R&D is very unpredictable. Yes? Okay, because the way we compute R&D expenses is, is you, take, uh, you take your operating income, you subtract, so basically you take operating income, you subtract out interest yeah. expense, you come up with taxable income, and then you pay tax and you get net income, right? Yeah. Basically, the, uh, the only people who are bearing the cost of the R&D are the people at the bottom, the net income people. The net income would have been a different number if I treated R&D as, so that, that's all I'm saying is the e equity investors came up with the money for that R&D. It wasn't the lenders because they got their interest expenses and I've treated them differently. So that's my rationale. If it has to go somewhere, it's got to go to the book equity. Mm -hmm. okay. Now let's talk about one time. Is somebody back there a question? Let's talk about one-time charges. Now the answer to the first question should be pretty obvious. Let's suppose you have a company that's reporting a loss of a half a million, a half a billion, a you know, one-time expense of a billion. You're trying to value the company. Remember what happened last year is completely and totally irrelevant, right? What you care about is what's the company going to make. So when you value this company, what are you going to show as your base year number? You see my question, are you going to show the loss, which is what the, the, the bottom line of the last year's income statement is, but given the fact that it's a one-time charge, what do you show? You should do the profit of 500 million, because in a sense, you say, but it was a loss, it happened already, it's already been taken care of, let it go. But now let's make things a little messier. You look at this company's financials, and every five years you see a one-time charge of a billion. It's not unusual. A lot of companies do these recurring charges, but they you know, the one-time charges, but they keep showing up. So what does it look like they're doing? It looks like they're playing games with me, right? Where they take these expenses, lump them all together, apply a one-time charge. Hope you forget it. Add a one-time charge. So do the sensible thing. If I asked you what the operating income for this company is now, what would you say? Take an average and say, really, you have a $200 million operating expense every year that you're trying to hide from me. Your operating income should therefore be $300 million, not, do you see why it's $300? You're basically going to add back $800 million. What that effectively means is when you look at your company and you see a one-time charge, don't take them at their word. I remember valuing Xerox. This was a while back. And you know Xerox has had a one-time charge every year for 10 years in a row? <laughs> I don't know what you call, a one, uh, but a one-time charge, it's 10 years in a row, it's a 10-time charge, at which point you're saying this is really an operating expense. In fact, British analysts in the 1990s came up with this term called EBBS, and it's not what you think. It was earnings before bad stuff. 
because this is what companies were doing. Our earnings before bad stuff was nine billion. By the way, there was a lot of bad stuff that happened this year. Just forget it happened. Okay? And companies have become masters at playing this game of moving things into the operating column and moving things into the unusual, extraordinary column because they know we treat it differently and they're taking advantage of it. Jordan. Yeah, there you go, which is revenues. And, and sometimes that's higher than the revenues, which is kind of a mysterious thing to me as to what exactly happens there. But you know, we've got to outsmart the companies when they play this game. We can't go with this adjusted or EBIT. Do not play that game with them, because if you do that, you're going to be sucked into that rabbit hole, and then you'll be Alice in Wonderland. Robert? Why do uh, analysts add that compensation? Because they're how what I say? I don't want to insult them because they're too lazy to think through the logic of what they've done. Because the minute you do that, you know what I would even encourage me to do as a company, right? I'm going to use stock yeah. for every expense because you say it's a non-cash charge. When in fact, what have I done? I've just skipped a step, right? If I taken the stock, issued it to the market, raised cash and paid you, it would have been an expense. If I give you the stock directly, you act like I didn't do it. It is an absurdly stupid thing to do. But analysts again do it because comp it's almost like they're in this dance together, right? Neither side wants a step. So the company says, oh, we'll add back the expenses. The analyst says, that's good, that's good. You add back the expenses. It's almost like you want somebody to come and whack them both on the shoulder and say, get off the dance floor. Stop dancing with each other. You're supposed to be an analyst and you're supposed to be asking tough questions of the company. Why are you going along with this adjusted EBITDA? And that's a big deal about the adjusted EBITDA. All these social media companies, we've just added back all the stock-based compensation because it's not a cash flow. Really? It makes no sense. But again, you know, we need to ask that question. Why are you doing it? Because it makes no sense. Yeah. Uh, maybe a better question is why do so many uh, uh, covenants and credit agreements have crazy adjusted EBITDA numbers? You think bankers would be a little... <laughs> After the last six years, I'm not sure whether I want to ask that question whether bankers are should be a little. They should be definitely a lot sharper. But we've discovered in the last six years that there, that there are basic things that I tell you, inertia is the biggest problem here. Is once something becomes an accepted practice, it almost becomes impossible to shake it because you have to make the case. Okay? So I'll send you the blog post I have in stock-based compensation because I basically take two companies, one with stock-based compensation, a very simple example and said, you know, essentially to show that the way we're doing things makes no sense because the two companies I created are exactly equivalent, but one pays its employees with shares and the other pays it with cash. And because of the way you do things, you're going to value the company which pay with shares. The analogy I would give is like a guy who runs a pizzeria who pays his employees with big pizzas at the end of every day. And he said, well, that's a, not a cash flow. He's giving away a third of the pizzas every day. Okay, that might not be a cash flow, but effectively, in-kind payment is just as much a cash flow as paying it out as, as dollar books. Okay. So when we start on, on, on let, let me do one final thing. The biggest problem is, is, is when you run into companies where there's accounting fraud. After the fact, it's always obvious, right? But there's a whole set of things, clues you can look for. Eh? For instance, um, you know the difference between accrual earnings and cash earnings is accrual earnings is what you see in the income statement. Cash earnings is what you see in the statement of cash flows. And one of the things people have discovered, companies that commit fraud, is the cash earnings consistently run behind the accounting earnings. I won't go through the entire list, but there's a whole area in accounting called forensic accounting. If I had the misfortune to be born as an accountant, that's the only area of accounting I'd be actually OK with. Because your job then is to dig through financials looking for clues. So I'll send you a couple of, a couple of references if you're interested in forensic accounting. Because especially if you're going back to emerging markets, this might be a skill set you want to acquire somewhere along the way. Yep. They actually had a course in that this semester I was enrolled in, but they canceled it because not enough people were interested. See, there you go. Yeah. And in fact, I think the way it's taught is I don't blame the people dropping out because it's taught this extraordinarily dry set of accounting rules. If you actually took real companies and you took them through the process, not companies where the fraud has already happened, but take Amazon, which is coming, I think, very close 
to that line of committing accounting malfeasance, the way it's reporting stuff. Because they, instead of adjusted EBITDA, report this free cash flow, which means absolutely, it's not free, it's not cash, it's not a flow. <laughs> right? It fails all three tests, but somehow they pass it on. So I'll see you on Monday. And remember, one week from today is your first quiz. This comes as a shock, right? It's been on your Google Calendar right from the beginning. Okay. It'll cover everything through Monday. So I'll send you an email on what to do to get pre ready for the quiz. I will not be doing a review session for the quiz, but I'll, I'll do an online review, a webcast review session. Yeah. 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 So uh, would you suggest us to kind of normalize the charges throughout, say, five, ten years? Yeah. To, because a lot of companies are playing, playing the games with kind of this long time charges. Yeah. They kind of sum it up and put, put it in one year and then yeah, that's they're not reporting in five years. And then, okay, so that's exactly. the way you do it, right? Yeah. And also on um, for capitalized le uh, leases expenses, you said when we capitalize all the leases, usually enterprise value will go up, right? Um, the reason why a company kind of fight back against this is because the equity value is going to go down. Might, is going might to go, go down. down. Might go down. Because of the debt, because yeah. of the increase of the debt. 